we will now have a panel driven discussion so not so much presentations only one for the start but now peter is there and he can take over for making an introduction to the closing and then so we, we are a bit later than foreseen in the official schedule but we still have now one hour to go and after this peter has to leave and then for the very end you can hand over to me and then i will do the final final closing then <laughs> thank you sandra that is very kind and i'm very glad to be here thank you so much for the invitation I have to say, I very much regret that we have to do this um, uh, virtual and not in person. I have very fond memories of the last bio conference in, in Berlin, and I'm very much looking forward to the next um, iteration, hopefully then in person in Basel. So um, keeping fingers crossed uh, in WHO, we are working uh, towards ending the pandemic with um, all the energy we have. Um, so welcome everybody to this final session of the summer edition of this Biocom AMR conference. Um, the the uh, title is how to further drive pull incentives on the policy agenda. And we are going to have a, a discussion with um, the participants. I will introduce them um, one after the other when I'm um, introducing them. And uh, I would like to start with Mark Jones. Um, Mark works at Basilea, where he's leading the development of uh, um, fungal agents and bacterial agents. Um, he is also benefiting from some push incentives. I know Basilea was one of the of the few recip European recipients of BADA grants, which is very remarkable. And uh, Mark is going to give us a bit of a perspective from the BEAM Alliance, from the small and medium-sized companies what do they expect from pull incentives and, and and what are their needs? And I do think, Mark, you said you have one or two slides to show us. Yes. Thank you very much, Peter. And I look forward to good discussion with yourself, with Thomas, Isabel, Greg, Jeremy, and all of those attending. So good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you are. So Mark Jones, Basilea, thank you, Peter. I'm representing really the Beam Alliance. So in essence, some comments that represent the, the desires, the wishes, the position of some 50 to 60 small medium enterprises here in Europe that have a stake in the antibacterial um, franchise. These are companies who are either pure players or partially want to develop antibiotics. And remember, much of the innovation, most of the innovation in new antibiotics, antibiotics are coming from small, medium enterprises who are entirely dependent on getting the finances right to survive. And we've had good discussion in the previous session on this. So top line, this is about pull incentives. And I think What's important is pull incentives have to be effective. And what do we mean, mean by effective? It means that from a financial point of view, they enable the cogs to start going round of smaller companies, SMEs, to develop in a way which can be financially viable, antibiotics targeted to the medical need that can work through the system and eventually get to patients. We know the costs of an antibiotic are developing a new antibiotic. They're really high, spread over many years. And once you get that drug approved, you still have a lot of costs. And in order to balance the financial equation, of course, you need revenue, you need income. And over on the right, you can see over the lifetime of that drug, if you cannot get sufficient income, the equation's not balanced and you cannot build wherever you are in that life cycle, but we're assuming early phase, perhaps preclinical, an adequate NPV. And if you can't get your NPV right, your board will never approve it, and you're never going to attract private investment. The cogs are not gonna turn. And this is the issue. This is why pull incentives, whether it's one or two, in totality, must be effective. The discussions of which there have been many over the last several years now, Perhaps there's two areas that are of particular interest from the Beam Alliance perspective. The subscription model, 
which now in the UK and Sweden, and we've heard some discussion in the previous session about this, is looking very interesting. I, I noticed Mark Gitzing, uh, the discussion Mark Gitzinger had said, please, not 27. I think that's a really important point. But the subscription model considers the reward for innovation, the reward for stewardship, the reward for access, the epidemiology of that organism, pricing. And in the UK, in Sweden, we have interesting models. We have the potential somewhere down there, coming down the pike in the USA via the pasture of a, a robust subscription model, can be a game changer. On the other side, market entry rewards that we've heard a lot of, I think there's particular interest in transferable exclusivity extension vouchers. These are really interesting because it doesn't require the stakeholders to fund, uh, to find enormously or comparatively large amounts of funding up front. No need for new source of funding. It also engages other therapeutic areas, cross-financing via the transferable exclusivity voucher, other therapeutic areas which for sure will suffer or suffer from multi-drug resistant um, infections. It's relatively simple. And of course, we also understand the need for guardrails around it, and they can be built in, ensuring access, good stewardship, and we touched on that in the previous session as well, perhaps capping value and time. On the next slide, there's perhaps just some top line comments on what the uh, pull incentives need to be. Do I change the slide? Maybe someone can do that for me, thank you. So there's some really top line aspects of what those pull incentives need to have in order to be effective, which we can consider in this section. Time critical. We're really running out of time. It's been years now that many of us have been attending this kind of session um, to try and tease out specifics, but implement them. Time is running out. Certainly many of the Beam Alliance companies who, um, who are certainly moving towards a situation where the financials won't allow them to continue. And this is the same for any small player involved or trying to be involved in antibacterials. So we need to do something soon, but they need to be right. Award sizes, they need to be transparent based on societal value. And together with the predictability of an award, the predictability that a company's technology can be eligible for award early on in its life or as early on as possible, are critical. This allows the NPV, the finances, to be built into a company's um, uh, um, activities early on in that process that they can build that into their financial models, build robust, predictable NPVs which can attract the funding I referred to earlier. Partial delinkage, I think, is particularly interesting. In Sweden, the subscription model also allows financial participation of the company should that antibiotic in fact be used more than was anticipated. And this is perhaps the first step in, or at least the first step in the direction of, of creating something that's more sustainable. Whether that's ever feasible, considering that antibiotics should rightly be kept in reserve on the top shelf, and anyway, you're to talking short course therapies, it's difficult to imagine how it can become entirely self-sustainable. And the process must be manageable. Whatever we arrive at, small, medium enterprises, small companies need to have pull incentives that are manageable from the resources available, the conditions of access, not crazy restrictions for manufacturing because these are simply not going to result in effective pull incentives. This meeting, I think, is a great example of what's really required now, getting the experts together, constructive dialogue, importantly, alignment on the right in incentives, the right constructs, getting the stakeholders together and implementing. And congratulations to the UK and Sweden, but there's one very long distance to go before we arrive at uh, an effective suite of pull incentives. Peter, thank you very much, and we look forward to good discussion this afternoon. Yeah, thank you, Mark, for this very concise uh, presentation of the needs and expectations of the small and medium-sized uh, companies that are really developing antibacterial treatments today. And 
Um, we see this every year when we do our pipeline review. These are really the companies that we see that are driving innovation at the moment. Um, and, uh, and so it's really important to have a discussion with you. Um, I would now like to um, ask Isabel Bigeregian Ding from the Paul Ehrlich Institute. And uh, Isabel is um, the head of the microbiology unit in the Paul Ehrlich Institute. And I'm sure that most of you don't know what this institute is about. And this is an institute that belongs to the government setup and it is um, responsible for vaccines and biomedicines. So for the medical products that are, for example, blood-based or, or biologically based. Um, Isabel, uh, given the, the mandate of your institute, um, we are talking mostly about the economic challenges of antibiotic drug development, but there are also scientific hurdles that explain the lack of new breakthrough investments. I, I, you know, now even in WHO, I hear people and tell me, oh, you have to learn from COVID-19. If you only put enough effort and money, we will get vaccines. And this, this is going to self, uh, solve our AMR problem. So um, can you give us um, your view and expectations? And, and is, is this um, feasible? Is this something that we should expect? Um, and how does this link, for example, for the story that we don't have yet uh, uh, um, effective vaccines for most of the bacterial infections? Thank you, Peter, for raising this question. I think it's a very important question and it shows how, how broad the portfolio of funding might also have to be to really move things forward here in this area. So I think um, one of the most important issues and where we also have focused uh, some of our research here in my department is on the predictiveness of the preclinical studies and the clinical development programs. Because of course, um, you can always optimize things, but I think in antibiotic resistance, you also have to think about innovative trial designs, and especially you were heading at TB. Um, we're all aware, I think, that that is a specifically very difficult area. So bacteria are very complex organisms. First of all, much more complex than a virus. Um, they have, it is harder sometimes to choose what an appropriate target antigen would be. And um, as if you look particularly at tuberculosis or um, the usual colonizing pathogens, you do not really know when infection will present and manifest at the time point of manifestation of disease is a very difficult parameter if you go into clinical development. And with the TB, we all know there is latency. There is, first of all, a delay in diagnosis usually. Then there is silent spread. It's not as active as with COVID, not that visible. Um, transmission is, of course, um, harder to track. We have very little knowledge so far, despite of a lot of research on uh, let's say, suitable biomarkers, which we could use to monitor infection, treatment, and so on. And so this also makes it difficult um, to define surrogate parameters that we could use for, for successful monitoring of our clinical trials. And um, with that being said, um, we, we were seeing a lot of new um, ideas and concepts actually in the field. Um, a lot of collaborative initiatives such as an IMI and the AMR accelerator where I think there is going to be new substances, potentially also new vaccines coming out, but also a lot of learnings for new tools on how to tackle these diseases. And also um, very relevant, at least for the vaccine development, is to understand the immunology, this latency and how the immune response actually um, needs to be triggered to provide long-term protection. Yeah, thank you so much, Isabel. I, I think that is the vaccine, um, the bacterial vaccine issues is really one area where we have not yet so much clarity also um, both in what is scientifically feasible we are going to publish later this year um, uh, as who um, uh, we are revisiting all the bacterial vaccines that are in development but also those that failed in development 
over the past years. So I think that should give us a bit of an idea on what we can expect. But then the question will also arise, who is going to purchase these vaccines and administer them? And to which, what are the target populations? Because we are not going to vaccinate all newborn children with these kinds of vaccines. So this is also something where we will certainly hit a couple of the same questions that we are having for the antibacterial treatments. And with that, I would like, yes, Isabel. Could I just very briefly comment on Please. this? Yes, indeed. In the experience that we have here in the Institute, this is always a very um, important question for the developers. So basically, they want to know that there is going to be a market. And so there needs to be a forecast on who would be eligible to such an such a vaccine or such a therapy and this has also turned out to be very difficult in this field of AMR and tuberculosis. Yeah, not to, not to mention the skepticism we have in a lot of countries about, I mean, administrating additional vaccines. Um, with that, I would like to, to hand over to um, Thomas Corny. I, I mean, Thomas doesn't really need an introduction. He's the Director General of IFPMA, which is the Global Association of the Pharmaceutical Research-Based Companies. Um, he's representing these companies on the ACT Accelerator, so he is very well aware of all these um, issues around COVID-19. Um, and he has been instrumental in creating the AMR Action Fund and is also the chair of the board of the AMR Industry Alliance. Um, Thomas, can you give, we heard from the small companies that Mark um, gave us a good overview. What can you um, tell us about the IFPMA members? Um, you did already, you set up this AMI Action Fund. What is the temperature today among your companies with respect to AMR? I think basically we have a chance to get some game-changing movement. On the one hand, the situation on AMR, and we have heard that, we all know it, is pretty grim. We also, in the context of COVID-19, of course, we were concerned, I think all of us, you, all the other panelists, that COVID-19 might swamp, uh, take attention away from AMR, because who cares about, you know, the silent pandemic, when we are still in the midst of the big, big pandemic. Now, my view, I've always been an optimist, as you know, my view is that actually COVID-19 to some extent helped us because it made people, politicians, but not just health ministers, but also ministers of finance realize the huge cost in terms of lives lost, but also in terms of public health of a pandemic such as COVID-19 for which the world was ill-prepared. And it did allow us to bring to the forefront the cost probably even bigger than COVID-19 of the silent pandemic, the slowly melting glacier, as Kevin Iterson normally uh, calls it. And it did help to make sure that AMR is kept on the agenda of G7, of G20 and other global institutions. What we did see, we all know, if you don't manage to get action after two or three years of an issue on the agenda of a G7, then you're almost on a losing streak. Here, what we saw this year in 21, thanks to the leadership of people such as Dame Sally Davis and the UK, it was big up on the agenda of G7. We did have a conversation, for example, with Commissioner uh, Kirakides uh, in June in Brussels, and she and many others firmly said, no, it's not the same. It's not just talk. We are really intent of acting. We do know that we desperately need new antibiotics. When you look at the portfolio, there are only about 40 antibiotics in clinical development, of which only a handful are considered novel. And only one new class of antibiotics has been launched in recent decades. Therefore, pretty grim situation and honestly, we would fool ourselves if we say that has already changed. The world needs new antibiotics. It is time for change. And that's why I also want to give praise and acknowledge progress made. We have already heard what's happening at some countries, but I think it is important 
the one game changer on a global scale could be pasta if pasta moves but i'm sure greg of course is greg frank is much closer to uh, the situation in the us it's far from a done deal you know we all hope and pray that somehow it will make it into one of those multi-trillion infrastructure projects in the US, but bipartisan politics is not that common in the US, as we know. And right now, the White House certainly is also distracted by events in Kabul and Afghanistan. We do believe that the AMR Action Fund rightly got traction, but we also have to be very open. The AMR Action Fund is not a solution. I've, we got credit from Big Pharma for setting it up, for being able to raise a billion dollars with partners such as EIB and the Wellcome Trust, listening to WHO in terms of the public health focus. We are making progress. I fully understand when I talk to colleagues from the Beam Alliance or SMEs, People, of course, they think, oh, my God, why haven't they moved faster? But to be where we are within less than two years of the initiation of the debate, I think is remarkable. And I'm very pleased that the AMR Action Fund did set up the Scientific Advisory Board. I couldn't have imagined a better placed person than John Rex uh, to be the chair of that uh, Scientific Advisory Board. We are all fully committed to really getting things rolling. I've heard CEOs of big pharma companies, including some of those who had quit the scene, uh, not to mention them. Uh, I think I can mention Roche, because for me, Roche, uh, following on Mark Jones, they did quit 20 years ago. They rejoined, and there's clear statements of intent. If uh, we are interested, we are investing, and if there is a sustainable market, we believe that we will get the novel antibiotics we need. But that's why we also need to call out on the European Commission. When I look at the debate in Europe, there's still a little bit of hesitation. And I've told UK friends of mine, my concern is that if you want to move from push to pull incentives, you better err on the generous side than on the conservative side, because we really need some game changers. That's why Pasteur, uh, hopefully complemented by this arm, could be so important. And I'm really interested to have this debate. It is important that Europe also gets the act together. My understanding is that many of the member states would rather like the commission to do something big on the pull scene. When I look at the individual member states' initiatives, they are, I think, really uh, deserve commending, but they are, same as the UK pilot, probably more on the cautious right, right than on the general side. As a Swiss, as you can imagine, Peter, I'm deeply embarrassed about the lack of action in our own country. Switzerland is one of the richest countries in the world and is remarkably absent of the debate about pull incentives. And when I once listened to one of the senior guys from the Federal Pub Office of Public Health, it was even more embarrassing when he said, look, we are so small, we couldn't move the needle. Now, for God's sake, to move the needle intellectually, you need to seize leadership. You need to realize that this, like COVID-19, is a question of public health, big threat of health security. And we from the industry, and uh, we talked about this together, we are not just, you know, walking to talk in terms of having raised $1 billion, which is much more money than you, what you would need for a pure PR gimmick. It is serious. We are also willing to engage and campaign for policy change, because if you do not run advocacy and campaign for policy change, we will not see change. And that's why I'm very pleased with the support we get uh, from the AMR Industry Alliance, we get from the biotech companies, from the generic companies, from Welcome Trust, EIB, because together we can make sure that we will win against this silent tsunami, the silent pandemic. Back to you, Peter. Thank you, Thomas, for this uh, overview. And, and I agree, I know you as a very optimistic person. And, and I do think, as you said, that 
the G7 with the UK being having the presidency at the moment, and we, we are following this very closely, there is movement. And then the Germans picking up, I do think on even with the with the new government that is going to be in place in Germany, I, I'm very confident that AMR is going to remain at the top of their agenda. And, and we really need to to use these two subsequent G7 presidency to make progress. Um, and one of the areas is, I think, um, Mark pointed to it. We need to do more work on the eligibility criteria because where policymakers are also a bit uncomfortable is like, and you ask them, okay, um, you, give, you give money out for new antibiotics, but for which ones and why for that one and not for that one? And, and how can we make it so clear that we really select those that um, that are really adding value and where we really have market failure and not just me too antibiotics that are developed to to get a slice of the cake and and of course i mean sorry to say that thomas but they have the impression that they have been you know they are a bit suspicious of industry they they are sure is going to to use a system if there's a system which is normal but so i think we need to do more work on really coming up with something which is targeting the products that we want to see without um, hindering innovation. And um, uh, handing over to, to Greg, and, and Greg, you are here as the representative of the AMR Industry Alliance. You are the um, director of global public policy of MSD. MSD is one of the companies that continued investing in antibiotics. So you have a serious um, antibiotic portfolio on the market. So I think you can really um, tell us what you expect, including from the Pasteur Act and and um, what you want to see in terms of pull incentives. Sure. Uh, thanks again, Peter and, and everyone else. Uh, really happy to be here on, the, on this panel discussion. And, and uh, while I am here representing uh, the AMR Industry Alliance uh, as a board member, I, I of course can't help myself to pontificate on, on the need for pull incentives in pasture. Um, and really, uh, when it comes to the Pasture Act in particular, uh, I think Thomas really said it best. This is an incredibly impactful subscription-based pull incentive um, that could really go a long way towards addressing um, that sustainable market challenge. You know, of course, it's not gonna get us all the way there. And that really speaks to the need for global action within the Europe and other countries um, to do their part to achieving that, that uh, that return on investment that, uh, that's decoupled from, from volume of sales that, that's needed to sort of drive the private investment back into this space. Um, you know, Pasture, you know, was introduced slightly last year. It was reintroduced by uh, Senators Bennett and Young, um, as well as Representatives Ferguson and Doyle this June. Um, and I can't possibly begin to uh, hazard an educated guess on its legislative future in the US, which I think Thomas uh, quite right pointed out. Um, it is a, a very um, difficult to predict environment, to say the least. Um, but that being said, I think the tenor of the conversation in the U.S., um, there is an acknowledgement that AMR, to, to everyone's point, is this silent tsunami. It's a public health threat in and of its own right. Um, it's related to our, our need to prepare for pandemics. Um, I think we have plenty of data that uh, uh, you know, we've all discussed in the past of how secondary infections play a big role in flu. Um, it's likely not as significant with COVID, uh, but there is data suggesting that these do happen, that resistant outbreaks uh, do occur. I believe the CDC earlier this year in the U.S. Uh, indicated there were at least 20 such resistant outbreaks in COVID wards. I'm sure, no doubt, that number has gone up since then. Um, so it's really important that I think that, that, that AMR has a spot in this dialogue about how do we better prepare for the next pandemic. And I'm hopeful that... Um, that as the Hill uh, in Congress, Senate and the House, as well as the Biden administration, who I, I feel also is acknowledging these links as they move forward to really collectively um, take stock of how we did with this pandemic and better prepare for the next one, that there's going to be a, a place for pasture and other AMR incentives. Because uh, really these antimicrobials are this foundation that the entire response relies on. Um, and um, I think I heard it best from, from the past director of BARDA in the US if, if we treat someone for, say, a pandemic flu outbreak or a radiological attack and they all die from secondary infections, we failed in our mission to prepare. Um, uh, and so I really think that we need to keep that in mind as we move forward. And, and my hope 
uh, perhaps to take a, a cue from Thomas's optimism that that pasture is going to find a path forward in the U.S. Um, hopefully sooner rather than later. Thank you, Greg, for this um, also, I mean, optimistic outlook. And uh, yes, I, I, Thomas, I think, pointed it out that COVID-19 made politicians aware of the threat of infectious diseases, whether they are viral or bacterial. And I do think that they learned the lesson, lesson that if you are unprepared, the bill is going to much is going to be much bigger than than what you can invest, what you have to invest up front. Um, and I can see in the, in the chat interesting alignment between Thomas and Mark on the on the size and the generosity of of any pull mechanism that should um, come into play. Um, and with that, um, I would like to lead over to Jeremy Knox. Jeremy is the policy and advocacy lead of the drug resistant infections program at Wellcome Trust, and and he has been really a leading figure in all these discussions over the past years. He was part of the Jim O'Neill report. And so he has really studied this um, issue in depth and, and he's also closely following the UK presidency of the G7. So, Jeremy, what, what can you give us um, in terms of outlook on what you expect as an outcome of, of this one and, and future presidencies? I'm also, maybe if you can, there's also G20 and the Indonesians, I hope, are going to put AMR on the agenda as well of the G20 because in reality, it's a bigger problem in the G20 countries than in the G7 countries. Thank you, Peter. Yes, and obviously we've already heard a little bit from uh, from, from Thomas about the, about the G7 and the G20 and what's been happening um, this year. I mean, I think for a number of years now, we've really been very optimistic and very hopeful um, about the possibility that um, getting AMR onto the G7 and the G20 agendas, um, what that might bring, particularly on the, the R&D um, incentive side. Certainly, you mentioned my past work on the, the O'Neill review. It was a very kind of key goal for us then to actually persuade the G7 and the G20 collectively that um, a global health issue like AMR should be on their agendas. Remember, the, G the G20 was set up as a, a group to consider um, economic cooperation following the global financial crisis. So really, it was a very novel thing for them to, to take um, an issue like AMR onto the agenda. Likewise, it was relatively new for the G7 to the health. So it's significant we've been able to really um, embed AMR onto the agenda of these groups and to make it a normal thing now that they discuss uh, major global health issues. But then again, obviously, the disappointing side is really we've not seen, I think, the progress that we would have liked to see um, in the past um, four or five years. Um, obviously, we've had some concrete steps. So, for instance, the one that, that really springs to mind is the creation of the AMR RMD hub. Um, uh, we've already heard about their, their some of their key work um, today in the conference. That was created by agreement of the G20 under the German presidency um, four or five years ago. Um, but otherwise, we've not really seen much beyond the, 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 the rhetoric. There's been plenty of warm words about the need to, to advance the, the, um, the challenges of, of, of antibiotic R&D, recognising the magnitude of a problem with AMR, but not really kind of much by way of, of significance, uh, either financial commitments or major kind of political commitments to move things forward. So I think when you look at this, this track record, and also when you can combine that, that relatively disappointing picture, with the fact that actually we're starting to see um, some countries kind of almost going alone, going it alone, either the, the UK or Sweden or, or, or even with the, the US of the Pasteur Act. I think there is a temptation to start saying, okay, well, actually what do, what value does the G7 or the G20 um, bring to this debate? I think if, if you don't believe that it's possible to get some sort of kind of cohesive, all-encompassing commitment from these two groups, then I think it's perfectly fair to ask, okay, well, what does it bring to the table? Really, can it um, help advance things? So I think it's easy to dismiss the role, but I think it's important to kind of hang on to the hope and really still push on the G7 and G20 um, as, as key um, forums for, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, and this has already been alluded to um, both, um, I think, with Mark Gitzinger's comments in the last, um, uh, the last session, um, and also so far in the session now, is I think the alignment and the coordination question and actually the fact that um, if we have the G7 and the G20 acting on this issue in a coordinated way, um, having some sort of kind of degree of, of cohesion in, in how they approach things, um, that will undoubtedly lead to better results um, overall. I think obviously there's some practical elements 
um, things like the question of how to um, define um, what we're incentivizing, things like the design elements around things like valuation, um, addressing quite technical questions like how to um, deal with the first pass the post problem, so not just incentivizing um, the first asset to get to approval, things like the, the environmental and supply chain aspects. I think it's really important to be able to have some sort of, of convergence um, on this rather than having a damaging divergence across the different countries that might just end up causing um, uh, kind of headaches and leading to a very kind of narrow set of, of products being incentivized. And secondly, I think really importantly, is the simply the critical mass um, issue. And, and, and when you look at the G7, for instance, that represents very nearly 70 percent, uh, very nearly 60 percent of the global um, pharmaceutical market. So really, if they decide to act, um, then that goes a very, very long way to delivering the type of global stimulus we need. But equally, if they decide not to act, if they fail to act in a coordinated way, that makes it very, very hard to achieve progress um, on the type of global scale that we need. If you add in the, um, the rest of the European Union, um, the, um, the rest of the G20 as well, you get close to 80 or 90 percent of the global pharmaceutical market. So even more potential there to really kind of achieve a truly sort of global level solution and the global level of, of pull that's needed and divide that type of two to billion, two to four billion dollar um, figure that Mark presented at the start. Much easier to divide that type of burden in a very manageable way um, across a larger set of countries. So coming back to the original question around, well, what's what's happening? What does the outlook look like? Um, I think obviously so far COVID has been a distraction rather than, than providing a, a, providing impetus um, in G7 and G20 discussions um, uh, around uh, AMR. But I think as, as Thomas alluded to, it really is to the UK's credit that this year they, they really have emphasised um, keeping AMR on the agenda and really trying to, to make progress in a meaningful way. Thanks to the leadership of Dame Sally, thanks to the leadership of officials who have been working incredibly hard behind the scenes, I know, in, in the UK government to, to try and get agreement from their peers um, around the G7 table. And I think it's been a very smart move, a very encouraging move that we've seen from the UK to, to really go down the route, not just of focusing on these kind of rhetorical political statements that are very easy to make in a G7 communique, but don't really deliver much, but actually to start focusing on the, the building blocks, the technical questions around things like valuation, around things like supply chain security, that actually will allow us, I think, to start making incremental progress um, towards a, a, a kind of a broader and a more, more coherent um, picture of, of actually how the G7 countries can together um, take action to support antibiotic R&D and support the wider picture. Obviously, we don't know yet what will happen with the German elections, but I, I think really the, the type of work that the, the, the UK has done this year, the type of foundations they've laid with these technical discussions that are involving not just health ministries, but also finance ministries, heads of government, industry as well. Um, this could be a really kind of a, a ready-made, oven-ready um, issue and, and possibility for the German presidency to, to pick up um, next year. Looking at the G20, obviously this is a, a very um, different picture. The politics of the G20 table are, are much more diverse, much more challenging on an issue like R&D um, compared to the, the, the G7 countries. That may make, make it harder to progress the issue, but I think we, again, shouldn't lose sight of the, the, the kind of the diversity that the G20 brings and, and the possibilities that, that lie with it. I think there's a real opportunity to align with what the G7 is doing around incentivization and also bringing questions that are important to the wider G20 membership. Things like access, things like stewardship, the, the questions of how we can really make sure that, that solutions that may be led by G7 and led by the market pull that the G7 countries can create, making sure they're kind of truly globalized um, for, for middle income countries um, in particular. We know that over the next kind of two presidencies in 22 and 2023, we've got um, Indonesia and, and India um, both taking presidency of the G20, two of the four largest countries um, in the world, the, some of the kind of the fastest growing middle income markets. If they could take on global health and AMR as, as part of that, um, we could make real kind of very exciting, um, uh, really exciting headway um, with the, the G20 agenda and really start to, to make up some lost time. Thank you, Jeremy. Yes, for this very um, honest assessment of, of what we've seen coming out of G7, G20. And it's true. I, I'm also always like between, oh, God, it's another resolution. Um, or, yes, there is serious action here. And I think 
Um, the G7 has a track record for both. I mean, and, and some things that they just, the Global Fund was born out of a G7. So they have done really significant initiatives. And, and I do hope that we can see this for AMR. Uh, it, it's, of course, the, the issue is, I mean, on, on drug pricing, even on a European level, there is no harmonization and countries really do not want harmonization on a regional, on a European level on, um, how to procure medicines and how to assess the, the pricing of medicines. So it's, I think it's very difficult to now take the antibiotics and, 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 and move to a, um, to a harmonized system. So I do think this, this idea of the, of the UK to come up with a menu of options for pull mechanisms, I think is a really interesting one. And then we need to have the monitoring that every country is following up and is doing something. And hopefully then in the end, it adds up to something significant. Um, I have uh, Greg. Greg wanted to to give us an, an overview about what is the AMR um, uh, um, Industry Alliance is doing. Thanks, Peter. Um, and uh, I'd be remiss as I'm representing the Alliance to at least not uh, talk a little bit about it. So appreciate you giving the floor and, and I'll be brief. Um, and I think everyone is aware of the, uh, the AMR Industry Alliance, but just to be sure, um, this was a, a, a coalition of, of biotechs, generics, diagnostics, and large pharmaceutical companies uh, formed in 2017. I think really response to that global call to action on AMR, and, and many of us recall the Davos Declaration as well as the industry roadmap where industry really set out what they can do to play their part on AMR. Uh, and since then, the Alliance has been regularly reporting on our progress towards those commitments but what I really wanted to flag for you all today is that um, last year, the Alliance really had a, a internal strategic discussion about what more can we do to contribute to the fight on AMR. And, and some of you are likely aware that in previous years, it's had done a lot of great work on responsible manufacturing. What else could we do that may be sort of in that vein? Um, and so we developed the strategic uh, plan where we've looked at each of our four focus areas, you know, promoting innovation for, for tools to prevent, diagnose and treat infections, um, improving patient access, contributing to uh, slowing AMR through appropriate use and finally manufacturing. Um, and just this year, we've really started on a few work streams and, and I won't go through all of them, but I'll, I'll, I wanted to flag a couple that may be of interest. And um, the first is, um, you know, on the research and innovation side, we really looked at this discussion of pull incentives and, and clearly the Alliance is supportive of the need to that, but we want to see where with our broad geographic footprint of members, both in the middle income countries, low income countries, high income countries, what could we do to, to really drive the conversation and where are some of the gaps um, that could be helpful? And so one of the things we are just starting a work stream on is, is looking at sort of the regulatory landscape not only between um, the developed world, but also within the, the developing and middle-income countries that have higher burden of AMR. How can we improve um, the regulatory requirements for the both where trials could perhaps be run more effectively in high burden areas that both improves uh, the path to market in, in maybe the emerging uh, uh, countries, but also in the developed world as well. So can we find some synergies across these fronts? So I, I, I won't say that this is going to in and of itself solve the problem, but the idea here is there is still room to improve on some of these fronts. And we think in combination of push and pull incentives, it could be quite impactful. Um, another example is really around appropriate use. And, and Jeremy could probably speak to this as well. Um, we have an ongoing collaboration with the Wellcome Trust really um, to ensure appropriate use of, of existing uh, antibiotics in conjunction with diagnostics. And we are, are developing a brand new uh, stewardship prize that's currently open to applications globally and, and are looking to acknowledge um, innovative AMR practices in, in low and middle income countries that could be used as a model that could be applied more broadly. So um, I'll leave it at that. You know, certainly we're, we're doing work in access and manufacturing that I think would be very aligned to these discussions. Um, but we were very excited to continue to work on these and report out to the stakeholder community how we're contributing to this fight. And in the last point, we are working on one more progress report. Uh, it is now the coming up on the two year mark. And so we are also very excited to be unveiling that. Um, very soon uh, to sort of track our progress on our commitments. So thanks again, Peter, and uh, looking forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you, Greg, for this overview. And indeed, we as WHO are also in contact with your colleague, Steve Brooks, in particular on this issue about environmental um, protection. And um, there's a lot of good work ongoing.
Uh, I have uh, Mark. Mark wanted to give us an, an um, outlook on what we might be able to expect on a European level from HERA, which is the equivalent to BADA that um, the European Union wants to set up. Yeah, no, thank you, Peter. Actually, it's more of a to, ra to raise HERA. I know many of the people on the call and discussions I had are fascinated by the p possibility in Europe that the Health Emergency Response Agency that through the that has now been, um, if you like, officiated through the European Parliament that needs to be set up. What is the potential of this? So full credit to BARDA and Basilea has benefited from funding from BARDA over several years. And if we look at the antibiotics that have been approved in the last, say, 10 years, I think I'm probably right in saying that every one of them has benefited from um, push incentive funding from BARDA. So the question would be, also considering the comment that I think, Peter, that you had made, you had mentioned that nobody wants harmonization in Europe when it comes to pricing and reimbursement. So we see these fantastic contradictions in the discussion, which we should really try and get rid of because it doesn't help that the political discussion that, that Jeremy at G7G20 has alluded to. And I think it's moving forward. So the question would be, in Europe, one way it would seem to solve some of the issues in implementation would be through the potential of a central agency like a health emergency response agency that's being established. On the back of COVID, what does Jeremy and perhaps Thomas from the IFPMA consider the potential of HERA? Could this be a solution to help us get to defined incentives and actually to implement them, at least for Europe, this solves the issue of implementation and involvement of all, all member states, which is forever going to be an issue. Thank you, Mark. Um, and uh, I would like to give the floor to Isabel before then going to Thomas to see whether he, what his expectations are towards HERA. Um, Isabel. So I think that indeed HERA is of course an opportunity to align the the interests basically of all the different member states and this might be a very important step. Um, but um, there again I think a lot of the discussion is still unfinished basically on the exact the exact outline of what HERA is going to be doing and um, there is, I think, many different concepts and, and what that could be and um, to, to which, which influence, basically, it would have. What I would like to point out is that I do think that the European Commission has already done a lot of work by funding programs such as the IMI program, which has enabled excellent research and the building of huge research networks within the European community and so there is also there is really an excellent basis to do this on, on European level so I, I think it's um, Hera might be a cornerstone to to this to the full portfolio but it is not an essential condition there is already a very good foundation laid that um, just needs to be maybe worked out more strategically into the future and um, further developed. And right now, as you see with the development of the new framework program, I think there is also some very interesting um, addendums to, to the program, such as the, the close collaboration with MedTech and with um, digitalization. So there will be um, a little bit of a new emphasis also um, in the program that will allow innovative clinical research and um, really build on what has been done in the last 10-15 years. Yeah, thank you Isabel for, for that outlook. Um, Thomas, what, what is your view on this? Now, Peter, uh, to be honest, my view is a bit mixed, and uh, I'm not quite sure that uh, HERA will be the game changer which uh, Buster could be, because uh, for very you know straight reasons, I potential I see potential in HERA 
it could complement, but it will never substitute in incentives because uh, the, the crux of the matter is that unless we are able to recreate a sustainable market, uh, rewarding novel uh, antibiotics for what they provide to society in terms of public health, then we will not succeed. Now, when I look in the context of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and compare, for example, BADA with what HERA could look like, somebody once told me that BADA really was so instrumental in fast speeding uh, the development and scaling up of new vaccines against COVID-19. One is uh, it really worked at speed. Uh, money didn't play a role. And uh, there was a willingness to simply forego bureaucracy. Now, anybody who knows Europe, think about speed. Money doesn't matter and bureaucracy, just forget about it. I'm not quite sure that we will ever see, you know, Europe being able to be a match of what BADA was. And BADA, in my view, would not be the right solution for recreating a sustainable market. BASTA is really about recreating a sustainable market. And that's where I believe that some of the G7 work led by the finance minister track and also by Sally Davis on, you know, properly evaluating the importance of novel antibiotics is so important. I could imagine in terms of global health security, for example, I've seen debates about it can be problematic if the only company still manufacturing a certain antibiotic is somewhere far away in China or in India. Therefore, the debate about, you know, reshoring, uh, thinking about also the proper valuation of generics, because if price and procurement is the only criterion, you will struggle to fulfill the manufacturing discharge target. And, and there I could see, for example, that something such as HERA could intervene, and we already saw debates in some countries. But overall, unless we get proper incentives, unless that we really focus on the need to recreate the market, which allows companies who succeed should get proper reward and companies who fail, they should be allowed to go out of business. I think that's by far the most incentive, uh, effective way of getting this right. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. And and I have to say that um, I was always very impressed by the flexibility that BADA had. I mean, just the fact that they um, awarded money to Basilea, which is a Swiss-based company, probably uh, Basilea wouldn't even be eligible for HERA, being that you are not in Europe. Um, and and I think it's like in Switzerland, Thomas, you mentioned it, the, the national fund, the, the way the way the system works is much more catering towards universities as a client as doing research and putting out grants to foster um, these kind of of of, um, uh, of projects. When we tried, for example, for Guard P to to get, I mean, to find funding in Europe. It's just there is no program. There was no program that would give money to a PDP, to a not-for-profit PDP, to finance clinical trials. It's just it's it's not the way it works. And um, so yes, I do. I let's hope. I'm very curious to see what is coming out of it. Um, and as a bureaucrat, I'm not going to comment on the bureaucracy of the European Union. Um, Jeremy, you wanted to say something about um, HERA as well and what we can expect on a European level. Yeah, so I, I think um, I, I think Thomas has made some very interesting points. I think there's a whole um, industry now of, in, in business schools of writing uh, case studies of, of what people can learn from from DARPA and, and now from BARDA in, in the US. So I think there's always a, a great deal of temptation to try and um, replicate their successes. But I, I think realistically, I, I think the comparison what we're talking about here as, an, as a European BADA probably isn't the most useful um, comparison. Um, I think BADA has done transformative things in the in the antibiotic space um, as a as a push funder. There are frankly lots of companies um, out there today who would would not exist right now were it not for either the broad spectrum program or for the um, the, the investment that, that BADA 
um, has made to, as, as a founder of, um, uh, of CarbX. Um, but I think actually when it comes to the market shaping, whereas in, in other areas of biosecurity, they've been able to really play a very active role in being a market maker and, and, um, uh, and supporting an ecosystem from end to end for those companies. They've not really been able to do that yet for, um, for, for, for antibiotics. And that's where Pasteur comes in in terms of the market stabilization. I think in terms of the role I see Hera playing, I agree with Isabel that there is a a very good opportunity for for um, for Hera to to perhaps play some sort of market making role that can transcend that can rise above the the challenges of of, um, of member state competencies and 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 find some way to de to deliver um, a stimulus um, to some degree um, uh, across Europe um, in a way that um, individual countries uh, individual members act by themselves cannot. But I, I don't think it will be um, a substitute for actually member states taking coordinated action um, on reimbursement and, and doing the type of things we've already discussed. Um, and I don't think they will. Um, it will become a, a replica for the, the type of push funding um, uh, on the scale that, that BARDA currently does um, in, in the US. So I think real opportunity, but um, it remains to be seen exactly what it can deliver in the antibiotic space. And I think we shouldn't kind of rely on it necessarily being um, uh, a facsimile of, of, of BARDA when it comes to its antibiotic support in particular. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And I think with that, we are at 4.15 p.m. And um, I think we, we had a very interesting discussion. I think there is always optimism in the room, some skepticism, but I think we've gone a long way since I joined the discussion. Um, I'm very much looking forward to see all of you in person in Basel in April at the next Biocom and hopeful then we have uh, some success stories to share from the G7, the UK G7 presidency and also progress in other developments. We for WHO, I certainly will be in the position to present a couple of interesting outputs. And with that, I would like to thank the panelists and hand over back to Sandra to close. Thank you, everybody, for this for this discussion, for this outlook on the policy level. And yes, as uh, Peter already mentioned, uh, we're very much uh, looking forward uh, to next April to bring together the community back into face-to-face -face meetings, and then hopefully on the on the policy level and on the push level, and on also on the technology levels because there are still some challenges to tackle there as well. We can, yeah push forward the discussion and maybe we have some results already and can really work on some more details. And as we have seen now, particularly in Europe, there's really, there are different national governments and they have their own system and their own challenges. And maybe together we can learn from each other and we can learn from the UK and from the Sweden and from hopefully from the Pasteur Act, which is maybe then already established. And then also together with the Beam Alliance, or the, our major partner, um, we can yeah drive the discussion so that at the end, also the small and medium companies uh, yeah, are kept in the field. So they are the, 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 the innovation driver here. And uh, we are glad to have the, the big farmers back, at least some of them. And uh, yeah, all together, hopefully, we can help uh, to fight against the silent pandemic. So hopefully, then see you <laughs> in April. Uh, please save the date already. The 7th and 8th of, uh, 8th of April is uh, the date. And we will probably have some satellite meetings around. So. Uh, keep the calendar free there and uh, yeah see you then and bye bye for this time thanks everybody goodbye <laughs>